fiery horse with a speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high of silver, the Lone Ranger. This faithful Indian companion, Toto, the daring and resourceful masked rider of the plains, led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver. Let's go, big fellow. I'll send the fire! Ruth Payne, the burly president of the Northwest Lumber Company, looked up from a stack of reports he had been studying. Seated with him at a table in the company's office in Walla Walla were four other men and a girl. Anxiety showed on the faces of two of them. They were young Larry Kent and old man Jordan, who shared the ownership of the lumber enterprise with Payne. Bill Collins, a rival lumberman, looked bored. The other members of the group were Mac McLean, the Northwest Lumber Company's superintendent, and his daughter, Jean. Payne shuffled his papers and took a deep breath. The Northwest Lumber Company is whipped. What? The rate we're losing money, we'll soon be broke. That can't be. Larry, you're an Easterner. You don't know the ups and downs of the lumber business. I know. I put every dollar I had into the company after you told me I could double my money. A year ago, I thought you could. Now the only way we can get back any part of our money is to sell our mills and timber tracks. Bill Collins of the Collins Lumber Company is here to make an offer. Bill, I'll make my best offer first. $40,000. Why, that's less than 10% on our investment. Ruth? I want to know why we've gone into the red when lumber prices are still high. I can tell you the reason, Mr. Jordan, but I'd rather have you get the story firsthand. That's why I had McLean and his daughter Jean come to this meeting. I don't believe I've met them. Mac is our general superintendent, and Jean helps him. Don't stare so, Larry. I'm not exactly a female lumberjack. I keep books. Oh, I, I beg your pardon, Miss McLean. Don't be so formal. Just call me Jean. Well, let's get back to business. Mac... Tell Jordan and Larry what's happened. <clears throat> During the last few months, half of our logs have been rustled. Rustled? How in the name of Billy O could anyone steal that many logs? Mr. Jordan, you know how we float logs down the Columbia River in rafts of 100 to 500? Of course I know. Well, the rustlers get them before they reach the mills. They probably sell the logs to some crooked sawing outfit. I don't understand about these rafts. Are the logs nailed together? <laughs> no, Larry. They're floated together in rows, then surrounded by other logs called boom logs, which lie end-to-end end and are attached to each other by chains. Oh, thank you, Jean. That's neither here nor there. Mac, I want to know what you've done to stop the stealing. <clears throat> First off, I notified Sheriff Barstow. He's been working on the case ever since without getting anywhere. Then what? I put our men on the rafts. Four of them disappeared along with the rafts. 
They were murdered, I suppose. I can't get any of the boys to ride the logs now. You can't blame them for that. Have you given up? Not by a jugful. I'm going to stop those rustlers by using an idea Gene gave me. <laughs> what is the idea, Gene? Well, when I was in Texas this spring, I saw how cattle are branded. I told Dad to brand the logs on both ends using the company's initials. What good would that do? The thieves would simply saw off the ends. But then the logs and the lumber that came from them would be an inch or so short of standard lengths. Well, of course, a 16-foot log could be sawed down to 12 and a 12 to 8, but that would take a lot of the thieves' profit. And not only that, they'd have all the ends left. It would be a big job to burn them without arousing suspicion. Mac, have the other companies lost as many logs as this concern? Well, they've had trouble, but their losses don't compare with ours. You see, their mills are upriver, close to their logging camps. Our mills are here in Walla Walla, much farther away from the camps and timber tracks. So the thieves have a better chance to steal from us. Mac, I don't think that tomfool notion of your daughter's will do any good. Never knew a woman to have a good idea. So I'm in favor of selling out. So am I. Well, I'm for holding on and fighting. I'd rather lose everything than let a gang of river pirates force us into a sale. That's the way I like to hear a man talk. Be reasonable, Larry. When I know I'm right, nothing can change my mind. You and Jordan may sell your shares if you like. I'm keeping mine. Maybe Mr. Collins will buy you out. I want the whole thing or nothing. Well, Mr. Collins isn't the only possible buyer. You look for another one while I look for the thieves. I may hire a private detective to help me. A private detective? Right. But first, I want to see for myself how things stack up at the logging camp. Mac, I'd like to go along with you and Jean when you return to the camp. Uh, come right along, sir. We'll soon be taking the upriver boat. A few minutes later, Roof Payne and Bill Collins were alone in the office. Roof clenched his huge fists and said, Oh, that stubborn Easterner. We can't let him get a private detective. I'll say we can't. We'll get rid of him before he makes any trouble and then buy his share from his heirs. We'll get rid of McLean, too. Why McLean? I don't want him to start branding logs. That sort of thing would just about stop the rustling. Well, that's so. Once I become owner of the Northwest Lumber Company, we can pirate logs all along the Columbia River. We'll make the other outfits sell out to us for a song and get control of the whole lumber industry around here. Well, that sounds good, but how are we going to put Larry Kent and McLean out of the way? We'll do the job ourselves. We'll go up to the camp and the company's steam launch. Our excuse will be that you've changed your mind. And want to look at the timber before buying out Jordan and me. I'm in this thing too deep to quit now. Let's go. It was two weeks later when the Lone Ranger and Tonto, riding southwest toward the Oregon Trail, reached a point where the broad Columbia River flowed through the thickly forested foothills of the Cascades. They were returning from the Ne Per Se Indian country, the scene of a recent outbreak. As they guided their horses through the towering pines, Tonto said, me not like big woods, Kimasabi. Too many places for ambush. This is a wild country. They won't stay wild much longer. There are many logging camps along the river. Look, we come to trail. It's what the loggers call a skid road. We'll follow it. Come on, big fellow. Come, Scott. Come, fellow. As the masked man and Indian turned their horses into the logging road, Gene McLean and Larry Kent sat on a fallen tree in a clearing with which the road connected. The girl was saying... Larry, I'm afraid that something happened to Dad. If he ran into those log rustlers, I... We're doing all we can to find him. I called in Sheriff Barstow. He and all of the lumberjacks are searching the woods. Ruth Payne and Bill Collins are looking for him along the river. They stayed on at the camp just to help. But this makes the third day since Dad disappeared and no one has found a trace of him. Oh, I do wish we could find his tracks. How would you know them, Jean? Dad is the only man around here who wears boots without hobnails or caulks. You see, he doesn't have to walk on logs. And we have a nice carpet in our cabin. I see. Larry, I, I keep thinking of the log thieves. I'm thinking about them, too. It's just as I told Sheriff Barstow this morning. They couldn't steal our logs without the help of someone connected with the company. But who would be in a position to help them? Oh, one of us share owners or a company official or a woods boss. Any number of people could do it. Including my father and myself, I suppose. Oh, no, Gene. I didn't mean you and Mac. I never thought of an... But, but... A mask, man. Quick, Gene, jump down. Go oh, I... A shot. Larry, Larry, let me help you. Oh, easy, silly big fella. I'll take care of him, miss. Oh. 
What's happening over there? My friend Tonto is after the man who shot you. Now, let me see your arm. Oh. Oh, you're lucky. You have only a slight flesh wound. Oh, thank heaven. Here, miss. Take this knife and cut off his sleeve while I get a medicine kit for my saddlebag. Right. Mister, I thought for a moment that you shot me. That mask... Don't disturb you. The shot was fired from behind a tree on the other side of the clearing. There. I'll hold your arm higher so I can bandage it. If it hadn't been for your warning, I suppose I'd be dead. I was jumping from the log when the bullet hit me. My friend and I saw the barrel of the gunman's rifle just as we reached the clearing. Who would want to kill you? As the Lone Ranger finished bandaging Larry's wound, the young Easterner told how McLean had disappeared and how he himself had planned to hire a private detective to investigate the log rustling. The masked man observed, Apparently, the attempt on your life has some connection with the log stealing. The thieves may fear that your detective would learn their identity. That must be it. Here comes Sheriff Barstow. What's going on here, Mr. Kent? Say, who's that fellow with you? He's wearing a mask. I don't know who he is, but he saved my life. Somebody tried to murder me. I heard the shooting. Now, mister, what about that mask? Perhaps you'd better listen to Larry's story before we go into that. Well, maybe I had. Go ahead, Mr. Kent. Larry quickly related what had happened. As he concluded, Tonto rode out of the standing timber. Thunderation. Now there's an engine coming. My friend Tonto has been hunting the bushwhacker. Oh, scalpo, fella. Easy, scalpo. Easy, fella. Fella, who shoot? Get way. Him run into brush. Maybe we find trail later. Is that his rifle you're holding, Tonto? Uh, him in, drop it by tree before him see me. And me not savvy that. Let me see that, Winchester. Uh, you take it. Uh. I thought I knew this rifle. It's Mike McLean's. See his initials on that brass mounting? That is Dad's rifle. Where fellas stand when him shoot, me find plenty tracks. Him wear small boots with small, smooth soles, smooth heels. McLean's tracks. Everybody knows about his boots. But why would Mac shoot me? Oh, he didn't, Larry. He had no reason to do it. He liked now, you. Now, hold on, miss. Your father had a better chance than anyone else to be mixed up in the log rustling. What? He pulled the wool over my eyes by having me look into the case. Sheriff, you don't mean I that. sure do mean it. McLean's a bushwagon crook. That's plain as the nose on your face. He's been prowling these woods for three days, waiting for a chance to drill, Mr. Kent. Oh, I can't believe it. Oh, you can't. Well, let me tell you something. The way it looks to me, this here girl of his led you to this clearing, got you onto a log, and set you up as the target for her old man. No, don't listen to him, Larry. Kent... I'm deputizing you to hold her while I round up the lumberjacks. They're going to help me get McLean even if he is their boss. Am I under arrest? What do you think? I aim to question you later, and I don't want you running away. Sheriff, it seems to me that you're being rather hasty. I don't want to interfere, then but i keep I'm... out of this. Now, Mr. Kent, take that girl back to camp. Larry, this is terrible. Sheriff, I don't want to be a deputy. You can't refuse. It's a law, and you're responsible for holding her. Here's one of my guns. Take it and use it if she tries to get away. I won't run away. Just take me to camp. No, I'll go after the lumberjacks. Come on, you men. Hello. Describe the man who shot Larry. Well, him about six feet tall. Wear blanket coat, cap. Me not see face. Him have back turned. Well, Larry. The description fits, Mac. But I still don't believe that he and Gene had anything to do with it. Uh, Kimasabi. Yes. Me think of something else. That fella run like him got hurt in feet. Hmm. It appeared that he deliberately left the rifle? That right. Toto, the sheriff overlooked the possibility that the would-be killer has another weapon. He may try again to murder Larry. See that he and Miss McLean reach camp safely. I'll look for the gunman's trail. Ah, uh, me take care of him. Larry, stay inside with Miss McLean. Keep away from windows and bolt the door. Don't let anyone in unless you're sure that it's the sheriff or one of us. I understand. Gene. Gene, please forgive me. The curtain falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger adventure. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments.
Now to continue. After Tonto had left the clearing with Larry and Jean, the Lone Ranger took the bushwhacker's trail. Meanwhile, Ruth Payne had hurried out of the woods and joined Bill Collins on a river sandbar near which the lumber company's steam launch was moored. Collins was asking... Did you get him, Ruth? Oh, confounded, I only winged him. Why, you always claim to be a dead shot. What happened? Masked man and an Indian rode up. The masked man warned Kent, and he jumped off a log just to pull the trigger. What? Did you say a masked man and an Indian? That's right, and they might trail me, so we better shove oh, off. Oh, the thing to do is ambush them. I think they're the Lone Ranger and his friend Tonto. The Lone Ranger? I always figured he was a kind of a legendary character, like that Paul Bunyan, the lumberjack's yarn. Well, you figured wrong. I heard first-hand stories about him in the Plains States. He's as real as the rope that will hang us. If we're ever caught and it's proven that we killed McLean... How can anybody prove that? I wore McLean's boots and left his rifle. And that's enough to convince Sheriff Barstow that McLean did the shooting. Well, why'd you bring his boots back? I didn't want the masked man and engine to find him. Then it may be I'll need him again. They pinched my feet. I could hardly wait to get him off. Toss him into the boat. Then we'll slip through the woods and see if you're being followed. Right. There they go. Come on now. A half hour later, Tonto returned to the clearing, his mission completed. He followed the Lone Ranger's own trail and soon found him bent over the pine cones and needles which carpeted the ground at the foot of a huge tree. Oh. What you see, Kimasabi? Look at this, Toto. The gunman sat here and changed boots. The boots were too small for him. Oh, and that's why me thinking got sore feet. Boots him chains to inch shorter. From wave tracks look, them got hobnails and soles. Toto, McLean didn't shoot Larry. An attempt has been made to frame an innocent man. Perhaps a dead man. At that moment, there was a slight stir behind the surrounding curtain of brush and low-hanging evergreen boughs. The masked man and Indian straightened and turned, drawing their six guns. A rifle cracked. Bark flew from the trunk of the big tree. Both men dove behind it as more rifle blasts shattered the silence of the forest. Then they began firing back, aiming below the smoke of black powder, which drifted from the screen of needle-bearing limbs. Otto, there are two of them. Work your way around and back of them. Let me think one of them try same thing. Only one gun shoot now. I'll watch for a trick. Uh, let me go. Dodging from tree to tree, Toto melted into the gloom of the pine woods. The Lone Ranger cast quick glances in all directions. Then from the brush in front of him, a voice called. I'm wounded. I give up. Come out with your hands up. I can't walk. Then crawl. All right. I'm crawling. Don't shoot me again. As the creeping man came out of the brush, the Lone Ranger whirled. Sensing that the fellow's actions were intended to divert his attention from the bushes on the other side of the tree, a gun barked. Hot lead fanned the masked man's forehead. Crouching, he sent bullet after bullet into the undergrowth. At the same time, the crawling man jumped to his feet and dashed for cover, only to encounter Tonto. Hands up, fellow. Don't shoot my guns are there on the ground. Not good. Now get over to the big tree and stay in front of me. He got one fellow, Kimasabi. Where are the ones? He's still hiding in the brush on the other side of the tree. This way, boy. Oh, that sounds like sheriff. It is a sheriff. There's a gang of lumberjacks with him. Masked man again. Masked. What was that shooting about? Sheriff, we've captured one of two men who tried to kill us. The other one is hiding over there. He may fire again. Make them release me, sheriff. Thunderation. That's Roof Payne you fellows are holding prisoner. Roof, how come you fired on him? Bill Collins and I thought they were outlaws. After seeing that man's mask. Well, then I don't blame you for shooting. I thought he was a crook myself when I first saw him. But he helped hang the deadwood on Mac McLean for shooting Larry Kent. But has Larry been shot? McLean nicked his arm with a bullet. The way I figured, he was scared that Kent would find out he was mixed up in the log rustling. Otto, does this man resemble the one who shot Larry? Well, him, same height, same build. Got same kind of clothes. Are you fellas trying to hang that shooting on roof? He or Collins may be guilty. We were on the trail of the gun when they attacked us. Bill Collins, come out here. You'll be safe. That masked man almost plugged me. Oh, him, that fella me see. Him too small. Bill, you and Roof, show me the bottoms of your boots. Well, I don't know what this is all about, but I'm lifting a foot. So am I. Just as I thought. You're both wearing hobnails. That doesn't mean they're innocent. It does to me. Let go of Roof. Very well, Sheriff. Release him, Toto. Uh -uh. Now, masked man, I want you and your Indian to clear out of this timber track and stay out. You're trespassing. Sheriff, we're here to help you. I'm obliged for what you've done, but you haven't any right on this property. 
If you don't get out, I'll arrest you. All right. Come on, Toto. All right. Fan out, boys. The rain can't be falling. As the sheriff and the lumberjacks renewed their search for a dead man they believed to be a fugitive, Ruth Payne and Bill Collins slipped away from the posse. Later, Larry and Jean had been waiting anxiously in the McLean cabin at the logging camp. Both the young Easterner and the girl resented the role of deputy which had been thrust upon him by the sheriff. Larry was saying, Jean, if you want to leave here, go. No, my father and I are innocent. I'm sure you are, but Sheriff Barstow thinks you're guilty. He can make a strong case against your father. It might be better if we both disappeared. Then there would be no complaining witness. If Dad would only come back... But I'm afraid, I'm so afraid that he never will. Why not? He never would have given up his rifle to anyone while he was alive. The man who shot you must have shot him first. Larry, Dad is dead. Dead. Now, now, Jean, maybe it isn't that bad. It's worse. While the sheriff is hunting poor Dad, the real criminal is laughing over what he's done. Why would anyone want to harm your father? He didn't know the log thieves, did he? No, but... He was about to start branding the logs. Well, who knew that? Only the five of us who attended the meeting at Walla Walla. I think we can leave old man Jordan out of it because of his age. But Payne or Collins or both of them could be mixed up in the log rustling. A few minutes later, there was a knock on the cabin door. Who's there? Ruth Payne. Thought I'd drop in, see how you are. Payne. Don't open the door, Larry. Remember what the masked man said. This is our chance to find out what he knows. I'll let him in. I have the sheriff's gun in my pocket, and I'll keep him covered. What's the matter, Larry? Can't you get to the door? I'm unlocking it now. Sorry to have kept you waiting, Roof. Think nothing of it, boy. Hello, Jean. Larry, he's pointing a gun at me. And take your hand out of your coat pocket, or I'll shoot this girl. I know you're sweet on her. Don't shoot. There's my hand. Now, take off your coat and drop it on the floor. I'll take it off. Well, what are you going to do? Kill you what? and take a girl where I can dispose of her later. You're crazy. You can't get away with this. Oh, can't I? Kent is going to look as though McLean came back, finished you, and rescued the girl. The sheriff will find his boot prints all around the cabin. A dead man what? makes a perfect alibi. You you killed Dad. I get rid of anyone who stands in my way. Oh, no. You shouldn't have thought of that log branding idea, Gene. <laughs> And you, Kent, shouldn't have refused to sell your share in the company. So that's it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Bill Collins and I will soon own every lumber and outfit along the river. No, you won't. You'll hang. For what? The sheriff will go on looking for McLean. And he's buried under the big brush pile in the clearing. What? Now, Kent, it's time that I... Drop that gun, Payne. The mask man. You're staying in front of me, see? <laughs> Grabbing the girl, Roof Payne tried to use her as a shield and bring his gun to bear on the Lone Ranger. But at that moment, Tottle smashed the glass from a window directly behind him. Drop gun and he shoot. Covered from behind, the crooked lumberman let his revolver fall, while Tottle crawled through the broken window. Get your hands up. There, up. Help me, Bill, help! Shouting for Bill won't do you any good, Payne. My friend and I had him bound and gagged soon after you left him outside on guard. I was at the door and overheard your boasts. You said enough to hang both of you. Oh, that was only talk. I didn't mean a word of it. I was playing a joke on the young Easterner. It's no joke when you wear a murdered man's boots. You even sliced the leather in the toes so they wouldn't pinch. Otto, tie him up. Oh, you tie him up. Tie Otto and I thought you'd make another attempt on Larry's life. That's why we followed you here. As the Indian holstered his guns and drew several rawhide thongs from his pockets, the killer charged him, knocking him back against the wall. No, you'll never hang me! He jumped out the window! Stop, Payne! Stop or I'll shoot! No. You hit him. That not stop him. Him running to river. Come on, Toto, out the front way. We can't let him get to a boat. Stop, Tyler! A few minutes later, the Lone Ranger strode into the cabin, marching Roof Payne ahead of him. Over his shoulder, he called, Otto, untie the other prisoner's feet and bring him in. Ah, uh, he got him. So you caught Payne. How did you do it when he had such a big start? Everything favored him until he stumbled over a cant hook some lumberjack had left lying on the riverbank. The hook caught the ripped toe of one of those boots he's wearing. Before he could release himself, we had him caught by a dead man's boots. Here, other fellow, Kimasari. Take the gag out of his mouth. Maybe he wants to say something now that we have his partner. Stand still, fella. We soon have gagged out. There. <laughs> you bet I want to talk. I know you've caught Ruth Payne with McLean's boots on his feet. Well, I wasn't with him when he killed Mac. Keep still, Bill. They have nothing on us. Nothing? What about those boots? 
If they aren't enough evidence to convict you, they'll dig up more. They're bound to find Mac's body. Payne told us where it is. And that's not all. They'll discover that I can't account for half the logs I ran through my mill. My lumberjacks will testify for the state when they learn we used them to steal logs from the Northwest Lumber Company. I'll make a clean breast of everything to the sheriff. I know I'll go to prison for stealing, but I don't want to hang for McLean's murder. Hello, tie Payne and Collins, and we'll go. Ah, uh, me do it. I thought you'd wait for the sheriff to return. No, that's not necessary. Those crooks deceived him once, but they'll never be able to lie out of the evidence you have or the statements they've made. Larry, all you need to do is guard the prisoners until the sheriff comes back. He'll recover Mr. McLean's body and see that justice is done. Poor Dad. It, it was all my fault that this happened. Miss McLean, I, I'm sorry about your father, but you mustn't blame yourself. But he was killed because I thought of branding the logs. Men have died for ideas before, but they didn't die in vain. The ideas live on. In time, every log on the river will be branded. Crooks like Payne and Collins will find it almost impossible to operate. And we got prisoners tied plenty tight. Then not get away. All right, come on. Adios, Miss McLean. Adios, Adios. Larry. Adios. Bye. Well, Ruth Payne, you've come to the end of the trail. And that's no credit to you, Kent. You and the girl would be dead now, and I'd be king of the Columbia River. Except for the Lone Ranger. This is a feature of the Lone Ranger Incorporated, created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Charles D. Livingston, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of the Lone Ranger is played by Brace Beamer. Brace Beamer.